Thank you, Sue. Thanks for the great introduction. And I'm going to be talking today about discourse analysis and how we can use it in the market research world. So here's my agenda that I'm going to be racing through over the next 20 minutes. Brands and service discourses. Where is it that this con these conversations are happening? Then an introduction to discourse analysis. Then I'm going to look at some specific techniques, conversation analysis, discursive psychology, uh, Foucauldian discourse analysis, some pragmatic approach, and then I'm going to suggest where market researchers might like to take this going forward. So first of all, where are those conversations? Well, obviously, they're happening all around us. They happen between organizations and customers. One of the great things about social media is they happen between customers and customers. Conversations have always happened between customers and customers. But with social media, we can capture those conversations and find out what's going on. They, ha they happen between organization and organization. They happen between outsiders, organizations, customers, and outsiders. Sorry, I'm just going to have to hit a button here and restart. <laughs> they do make everyone surprised. So, I'll give us uh, run number two. Um, an introduction to using discourse analysis in market research and how market researchers can apply this new discipline. We're going to run through these topics, brand and service discourses. Then I'm going to give you an introduction to discourse analysis, looking at conversation analysis, discursive psychology, what Foucault has brought into this area, some pragmatic approaches, and then explore how market research might roll this out going forward. We need to think about where these conversations are happening. Um, they're happening between organizations and customers, and customers and organizations. They're happening between customers. They are happening between organizations and organizations, so between suppliers and vendors, between governments um, and buyers, between trade unions and organizations. So there's a vast number of types of organization to organization, and they're happening from outsiders, so people not involved in the client or the topic we're researching, but who still might be inputting items, thoughts, and elements into that process. So where do these conversations take place? They take place in social media. They take place, of course, face-to-face. -face. The home of um, discourse analysis was in face-to-face -face conversations and in telephone conversations. The conversations also take place in letters. They take place in emails. Uh, we have the survey responses. Those are also discourses. Media, all sorts of conversations happen online. They happen in the TV. They happen on radio, phone-ins, all these sorts of things. And there are official reports. So all of these are discourses that we might want to examine. So first of all, the introduction to discourse analysis. It's a family of approaches. It's no one specific technique. And all of these approaches have got slightly different rules and elements to them. But there are four things that they all have in common. The first is that discourse is constitutive. It makes things happen. If I shout fire in a theater, it's not a description. It's something that causes something to happen. When I go to the coffee shop and I ask for a coffee, I get a coffee. It causes the coffee to happen. So we shouldn't think of language as being something that is just transparent. It actually makes things happen. Similarly, it's contextual. What may be acceptable to say in one place is not acceptable somewhere else. It creates a different activity. Refuse and refuse, um, all of these sorts of things make a difference. The level of grammar, the level of politeness that we apply in different situations, when we are in the, the right and when we are in the wrong, all of these things matter to the way that discourses happen. It's what um, Bakhtin called dialogical. Language is contested. We don't take everybody else's way of speaking as being the way it should always be. There is no, particularly in English, no single authority that defines what language means. Language 
tends to drift, it tends to change. There are people who are pushing that change and there are people who are fighting that change at any moment in time. If we look at the history of the word gay, for example, how first of all it had one meaning, then it became adopted by the gay community as a reference and now in many parts of the world it is being grabbed on to by younger people for new definitions, uh, plastically inauthentic and so on. That use of language is contested. Um, we can see, in particularly in the USA at the moment, contested language around the issue of what is marriage. Now, the other thing that is fundamentally different about discourse analysis and common to all of them is that they see it as an end, not as a proxy. So we don't look at the open ends as simply a method of finding the content, but we're looking at the way that language is used as a valid area of exploration. So, the traditions of discourse analysis, conversation analysis, I'm going to be looking at very closely, and discursive psychology. Then we have forms that look at the language almost from the top down, so not bothered about individual conversations or individual words, but what is their relationship to society? How do they reflect what is knowable? And this would be uh, Foucauldian and Bactinian from Foucault and Bactin. Then we get sociolinguistics, including corpus research, a lot of powerful computerized techniques trying to work out what language is doing, how are gender and power expressed in language. We have various critical forms of discursive analysis and some pragmatic extensions, which I'm going to run through. So looking at conversational analysis, this is perhaps one of the easiest ones for outsiders to get a, a handle on. It was invented back in the 60s by Harvey Sachs. And what he did was a really close examination of what people do when they speak. What are the patterns? What are things that you can see happening? How does it work? And I've got three examples. And the first one is actually taken from Harvey Sachs's own work, his lectures. Um, and these were published in 1995. He was long dead, unfortunately, um, by then. But they were published in 1995. This is one of his lectures. And he was taking the telephone calls from um, people ring up a mental health center and they were asking for help and advice and he was able to access tape recordings um, and they weren't tapes and they were tapes in those days to analyze them and here is one conversation operator go ahead please this is mr De smith and then we see the annotation b says hello of the emergency psychiatric center can i help you the reason that this guy a says his name is that they have discovered that if the first person says their name it's likely the second person will too. That's a rule that has come out of conversation analysis. So B then says hello, A says hello, now that should generate a message and we can see that B then is out of sync, I can't hear you. This breaks the rules. When we see a conversation broken then we can actually see what the normal rules are. If Person A says hello, person B says hello, the first one then has to take the conversation somewhere further. And by analyzing conversations at this level, Harvey Sachs was able to explore what was going on. And over the next few years, this went further and further forward. And here's an extract of a counselor talking to somebody who thinks they're at risk of having AIDS. And what we will see here is that um, C is for the clinician and P is for the patient. And the type of documentation we have in this is very different to the typical way transcripts are given. Let's finish this HIV thing. Pause. These are very, very short pauses. Then we have breathing out. So, do you understand about the antibodies? That equals sign means that the yes, I comes in immediately at the end of that question. And the word do and the right overlap with each other. So we're looking at how this pattern of conversation is going on. We can see these pauses that are taking place. If we go down to line seven, uh, the patient, well, uh, a pause of 0.4 of a second. In a conversation, that's an enormously long pause. You have a look at people talking to each other and in the bar, in the office, and you will notice that pauses are not normally as long as 0.4 of a second. It means something is happening. Aha, uh -huh, to tell you the truth. They're establishing the footing for the comment. It's only I uh, like Friday. That's what we call a repair. They're trying to find a way of phrasing it by looking at these particular patterns. Even if you didn't know that talking about sex in the VD clinic was a sensitive subject, you would be able to define that 
from the pattern of this conversation. So if we take the market research world and we look at a focus group transcripts, or if we look at interviews with a respondent, or if we look at some of the responses in a CATI survey, we might see that actually people are equivocating. They're trying not to answer directly, which would tell us that we're going about the question in the wrong way and that we might want to explore things in another way. Here is another example from the literature from Kitzinger. And it talks about a university campus campaign a few years ago of Just Say No, a method of encouraging young women just to say no, if they didn't want to have sex, they shouldn't feel they had to have sex, um, and they should just say no. And Kitzinger's point is that actually no is a very difficult thing to say in general. So if I say to you, oh, let's go to the pub, and you, want, you say yes, that's fine. Saying no is always a little bit odd, so people will say things like, oh, I'd love to, but I'm busy. Um, oh, I'm on a bit of a weight loss at the moment. We might say, why don't you... Um, come to my house for dinner. Again, no is a very uncomfortable thing to say. Or, oh, I've got another engagement. Whatever the reason is, the last train would, would not be available. We'd like to find another way of declining rather than saying no. No is not very easy. Now let's move that into the area of dating, where the young woman may be very attracted to the guy. She just doesn't want to have sex on this occasion. No is not an easy thing to say because of all the programming, the fact is what conversation analysts call a dispreferred response. And that's why the Canadian Federation of Students, for example, came up with this poster, mostly for the benefit of guys. No means no. Not now means no. I'm in a relationship means no. No thank you means no. You're not my type means no. So the absence of the specific word no is not as relevant and therefore the uh, university authorities and the legislators trying to put all of their eggs in the just say no campaign were missing the point. Moving on from conversation analysis, and I did say that this is a bit of a, a rocketing through session, let's look at discursive psychology. What if neuroscientists are looking in the wrong place when they're trying to understand our minds? They're looking between our ears and maybe a lot of what is um, our thinking process is actually between people's heads, not within their heads. In traditional psychology, we use what people say to try to guess what's going on inside their minds. Discursive psychology categorizes and study what people say as the phenomena of top of investigation. They don't try to make guesses about how that relates to what's inside people's head. So let's think about thinking. We tend to think about the way that people talk to each other is you think in these abstract ideas, then you articulate it into words when you talk to somebody else, and it goes back into these abstract ideas. But Wittgenstein, all the way back in 1958, talked about the fact that every time he thought, he thought in words. And when he described ideas and when he received ideas, they were in words. So perhaps those ideas only really exist when we say them. We might be saying them to ourselves, we might be running those ideas through our head. But the vast majority of social ideas are done in words between people. Yes, you're going to get some ideas like angry, blue, pictures, things in mathematics. But if we talk about social ideas, it does appear that they are mostly in words. Now let's look at attitudes, something that market researchers do all the time. A traditional definition, an enduring organizational, motivational, emotional, perceptual, and cognitive process with respect to some aspect of an individual's world. We ask our survey questions because we think that people have attitudes, and we should be able to measure those attitudes by finding out what is inside their head. However, Crutch and Crutchfield and others have suggested that, sorry, Crutch and Crutchfield suggested that interpretation, and that's the one that market researchers would frequently do. But we know that if we anchor them, if we frame those questions, we get contradictions. If we ask people, do you want something that's 3% fat free, or something that's 97, sorry, 3% fat, or 97% fat free, we get different results. We ask people the questions in, in their different context, with a different question before it, and we get very different answers from the same people. And for more on this, have a look at uh, Bree Williams' presentation this morning, which should be up on the site soon, about behavioral economics, which is all about the fact that we give different answers to the same question 
when it's put to us in different places in different times. So what's going on there? Well, we can see what's happening when we think about contradictions. We all have these sayings, common sense is always right. One of the reasons that common sense is always right is it's got all the options covered. It, you can either say many hands make light work or too many cooks spoil the broth. Knowledge is power, ignorance is bliss. Look before you leap, he who hesitates is lost. Clothes make the man never judge a book by its cover. Because these are polar opposites, one of them will always apply. That is the power of common sense. We will apply those attitudes that are appropriate. Now, we don't all have the same attitude set. Um, the socialist and the fascist are going to have some very different views. They will probably have some that overlap, but every individual appears to have a portmanteau of attitudes. Um, and between us, we have the portmanteaus of attitudes, all these different ideas. And when we try to do a survey, we just get those representations from the suitcase that actually fit the context of that survey. We're trying to find something that doesn't exist when we assume there is a constant set of attitudes. What about memories? Surely they're our own. Again, there's quite a lot of evidence that these are negotiated, that we discuss them together. So when grandma sits looking at the family album with the young lad there, when, as he grows up, he will not necessarily be able to differentiate between memories that he has that he experienced and memories that he had which he learned through the discourse of talking to people, of seeing pictures. When people have brain damage, they often spend time looking at um, movies and videos and photographs of their lives prior to then to regain their memories. Well, it may be that rather than regaining their memories, they're actually recreating their memories. We see this when people go out for a night out and they come back the next day and they negotiate in the office about what happened and they look at Facebook and over a period of time, those memories become created by the discourse of talking to each other. Moving to this uh, much higher level picture now, Foucault and the Foucauldian discourse analysis, and it shifts this away from individuals to what's happening in society. It's very much post-structuralist and it's a constructionist sort of way of looking at things. What is said is governed by what society has created and is creating. Some things cannot be said at certain times. If they are said, they start to change the meanings. So meaning is created socially, not within our heads or even within individual conversations. Foucault talks about regimes of truth, things that are knowable, things that are sayable at any moment in time. But he very much argues there's not a top-down model. There aren't experts that create language. Language is created by all of us. We have different powers within that. Some of us are much more influential, some of us are much less influential. We can also look at genealogies. How has this language moved forward? So just to anchor all this in the real, think about Starbucks. There was a time that the person who served you coffee was called the person who served you coffee, the person in the coffee shop. They became the barista. The barista meant that they had expertise in the coffee area. When Starbucks first started um, becoming a global brand, in many parts of the world, people didn't know how to say cappuccino. So they put signs up. They wanted people to talk their language. They invented things like the venti, the 20 fluid ounce cup, and they gave it a name. They created a language, which means as soon as you hear it, you know they're talking about coffee. With many of those phrases, you know they're talking about a Starbucks coffee. And they start to constrain the language. And it would be very hard to talk about a venti of tea in quite the same way because it doesn't quite work as a piece of language. So we can start to explore what things are sayable about brands, how brands can battle for control of a piece of language. So that brings me to pragmatic discourse analysis. Now, this has got several names, social media monitoring, blog mining, buzz monitoring, listening research. Most people involved in this don't realize that they're dipping their toe into this academic discipline of discourse analysis. And they would be greatly aided if they were to find out more about the academic discipline, because they'd be able to do even more with the tools that they're using. What we can have a look at are things like memes and influence, and how do they travel through social media? What about turn-taking within online discussions? If two people are standing at a bus stop, they know what the rules are for speaking to each other. 
A speaks, then B, then A, then B, then A. If there are four or five people, it's a bit harder to work out the pattern, but we know that it shouldn't be A, B, A, C, A, B, A, D, because that would be A hogging the time. Online, it's not clear exactly what the rules are. Sometimes people will post two comments, one after the other. You might be typing your comment, and while you're typing your comment, four other people's comments might appear in that conversation flow, but you're not actually intending to follow those four, you're following the persons you noticed beforehand. So we need to do a lot of work about looking at how turn-taking actually operates within online discussions. What about conversation analysis for communities? What are the analogies for pauses, repairs, and repetitions? What are the optimal ways for a moderator of an online discussion getting as many people to talk freely and openly and honestly and revealingly about the topics of conversation? What are the right probes? How should turn-taking be done? What are the adjacency pairs that we should be looking for really to optimize those conversations and to analyze them? Looking back to say, well, it looks like from these sort of responses, people are not being very honest because there's lots of repairs, there are pauses, there are equivocations, <laughs> there are changes in footing. And we want to look at those and say, okay, if we if we look at those, we can see this conversation isn't really revealing something. We need to do some extra analysis, some different ways to get to the bottom of it. So I think there are a couple of key lines of inquiry that we can follow with discourse analysis in this area. We can look at tactical issues, training offshore call centers using conversation analysis. What should they be doing to make sure those conversations work better when they're doing catty interviews. Improving the social media monitoring, looking for better clues. What are exactly the phrases we should be looking for? Customer interaction training, so use of change of footing. Interviewers, door-to-door -door interviewers have known this for a long time. How do you change the topic in order to be able to advance forward? But also strategic issues, rethinking customer satisfaction, brand positioning, friend, advisor, expert. In terms of advertising, what sort of things do we want people to say? What ideas are expressible about your brand? Is it possible to call your brand exciting? Um, we have, for example, I've just been flying on a lot of airplanes. I would never like my airline to be described as exciting. It's not one of the things that is sayable about a good airline. Just one very specific example, customer satisfaction. In the traditional world, we try to think about how we turn people from unhappy customers into happy customers. We think we know what is inside their heads. This is coming back to this old-fashioned form of psychology. Get inside their heads and we know what happy customers and unhappy customers are. A discourse analysis model would focus more on what we want people to say. Now, all of a sudden, that becomes really objective. We think that people should be saying these sorts of things about our brand. We do not want people saying these sorts of things about our brand. So what do we need to do to change the experience and the actuality of the brand to make it? What are the words and phrases that we want to use? Are they sayable about our brand? Can we change what is sayable? What are the words, phrases might be good for us to use? And all of this would change, would be, become a much more actionable form of customer satisfaction rather than something that's focusing on latent constructs that we can't directly measure and we can't directly envisage. So that's a very quick introduction. I'd like to say thank you, everybody, and uh, I look forward to questions.